Hello again, Internet. This is Dan Alasso with History for Today. And this morning I'm planning on doing another multi-part chapter or lecture for my Modern World History course. This one is about early globalization and revolutions. So as I've previously mentioned, by 1500, Western Europeans had really been unable to pull themselves together into the type of extensive land empire that we've talked about in Asia the Chinese, the Mughals, the Safavids, the Ottomans, or anything like the Roman Empire that they remembered fondly. The Habsburg family continued to try to maintain an entity that they sort of optimistically called the Holy Roman Empire. But it wasn't really holy, it wasn't really Roman, and it wasn't really an empire. It was really an alliance of German principalities. It had actually ceased to include Rome itself in the 12th century. During the 1600s, language and social customs and ethnicity, and especially religion, began inspiring feelings of regional solidarity that grew into the idea of separate nationalities. Some of these nations organized themselves as absolute monarchies, while in others, power began to be shared among different groups. This consolidation of nationalities happened over several centuries. By 1500, as I've mentioned before, Europe had about 80 million people, and they were divided into about 500 different states and principalities. 300 years later, in 1800, Europe's population had nearly doubled to 150 million, but the Europeans lived in just 30 nations. In many of these countries, the ideas of divine monarchy and hereditary nobility had begun to give way to a sharing of constitutional power between rulers and their subjects. Now, to clarify for U.S. students, where we think of the Constitution very much as a document on paper, many nations, like, for example, Great Britain to this day, when they say Constitution, they mean the way their government and society is constituted, not a specific document. But in any case, in the ways that these societies and governments were constituted, merchants and people of growing wealth who were not of the noble classes began to gain influence and actually to slowly acquire legislative powers in some places, in bodies like Britain's House of Commons. The French Revolution, inspired in part by the revolt of Britain's North American colonies and the establishment of the United States, would extend this experiment in democracy actually to include the lower classes for the first time in European history. France's revolution, which I'll talk about in a little bit, would end one of the most deeply entrenched absolute monarchies in Europe, while Napoleon's armies would later end feudalism in most of continental Europe by 1815. France developed into an absolute monarchy under the Bourbon dynasty. Louis XIII, who ruled from 1610 to 1643, and his chief minister, the Cardinal Richelieu, who you might remember from the Three Musketeers, concentrated power in the hands of the king. The king actually stopped convening the Estates General, which wasn't really a legislature, it was more of an advisory board made up of representatives of the three estates, the clergy, the aristocracy, and the working people. The king stopped consulting with them and decided to rule absolutely. The French monarchy was able to hold back many of the democratic advances of neighboring nations like the Netherlands and Great Britain because of the centralized power and really the personal authority of the longest reigning king in European history, Louis XIV. Although Queen Elizabeth II has either just recently surpassed him or is about to, the Sun King, Louis XIV, occupied the French throne for 72 years, from 1643, when he became king and emperor at the age of four, after his father, Louis XIII, died, to his own death in 1715. By the 1680s, after he'd become an adult, Louis began to improve France's influence in the world and also to increase the power of the monarchy itself. In 1682, Louis XIV moved the royal court from Paris to Versailles, a country palace about 13 miles from the city. And he required the nobility to live in the palace where he could keep an eye on them and keep them under his thumb. 
but he also modernized Paris under the direction of his finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Constitutional states like Britain, on the other hand, shared power between hereditary monarchs and the House of Lords and the other legislative body, the House of Commons, that represented at least some of the people. In Britain's case, Parliament actually also controlled the government's purse strings. Britain fought a civil war between 1642 and 1649 when a Protestant religious sect known as the Puritans and their allies in Parliament led a revolt against absolute monarchy, which was championed by King Charles I. A Puritan-dominated parliamentary army led by Oliver Cromwell beat the Royalists on the battlefield and then executed King Charles I in 1649. Cromwell's 10-year experiment with a republic, which he called the Commonwealth, unfortunately degenerated into a dictatorship. And after Cromwell's own death in 1659, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to pass the leadership on to his son, who in any case wasn't really up to the task of ruling. And so the monarchy was restored in 1660. However, Parliament held on to enough power to depose the Catholic-leaning King James II in 1689 and invite his daughter Mary and her Protestant Dutch husband, Prince William of Orange, to take the throne in a peaceful transfer of power that became known as the Glorious Revolution. So now, before I continue, a couple of questions for discussion. First, how did the French and British styles of government differ? And then secondly, why did England have a civil war in the 1640s?